This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces joining us from all over the world on the Internet today, as well as listeners tuning in on radio affiliates in every state in the union. Thank you for catapulting the Costa Report to the fastest-growing, independent, nonpartisan news program in the country. In just a moment... Former White House Chief of Staff in the Clinton administration and the man responsible for a deficit reduction program which produced one of the most impressive federal surpluses in our country's history, Mr. Mac McLarty, will be joining us to talk about the new tax plan, the bipartisan Alexander Murray health fix, and similarities between President Clinton and Trump's first 10 months in office. We tend to have very short memories, and every day those memories get shorter. So many of us have forgotten the rocky road President Clinton had to put, uh, had that uh, in pulling his cabinet and staff together and working with Congress to put his agenda through. But Mac McLarty not only remembers, he also has some valuable insights on how Trump can work more effectively, and I can't wait to find out. But before Mr. McLarty joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Thomas F. McLarty III was born in Hope, Arkansas. McLarty graduated from the University of Arkansas and worked his way up through the ranks of the Hope Auto Company, started by his grandfather. At the young age of 24, McLarty was elected to the Arkansas State Legislature, and by 74, he found himself chairman of Arkansas's Democratic Party. In 1979, McLarty went to work for Arkla Gas, which he quickly rose to become the company's CEO and was recognized by Forbes, the Financial Times, and the Wall Street Transcript for his management excellence. All the while, McLarty continued to raise money and be a trusted political advisor to Clinton. Then in 1993, McLarty became the nation's 17th White House Chief of Staff. When he entered the role, the Clinton cabinet and staff was in disarray and not only in need of clear structure and processes, but also desperately in need of bipartisan cooperation in Congress, something we'll hear a lot more about in the next hour. Today, McLarty is the chairman of McLarty and Associates and McLarty Companies and continues his work in public service. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, former White House Chief of Staff, Mr. Thomas Mac McLarty. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. McLarty. Rebecca, I'm delighted to speak with you. Now, before we dive into the this new tax plan and health care, these new uh, health care proposals, I think right. we all need a reminder that President Clinton also had a rough 10 months in office, his first 10 months, uh, uh, until you stepped in to the White House as chief of staff. And uh, you happen to be the oldest and closest friend of the president. Mm-hmm. So no one has a better understanding of how chaotic things were. And uh, and so tell us a little bit about how you and President Clinton turned that around. Rebecca, uh, I think any first year of any administration is a challenging one. Uh, presidencies like businesses and even in our lives have passages, and that was certainly the case in 1993 when President Clinton raised his right hand and was sworn in on January 20th. I think the place to start is in our case, in the Clinton years, President Clinton came came to the White House after 12 years of the Republicans having the White House. So there was a big change, is my point. And you have so much to do in a transition period that it can be a bit overwhelming. Some of that has changed, and perhaps we can talk about that later in your program. But uh, for this for this segment, I think you've only got between the election in November to January 20th, to get 4,000 positions, or at least beginning to get those positions filled in government, to get your cabinet in place, as you noted in your introduction, to get your agenda put forward, uh, to step on the world stage, and the most sacred responsibility of any commander-in-chief is the safety and security of the American people. That's a lot to do, and there's a lot of stakeholders. In our case, we were fortunate, Rebecca, to get our cabinet approved, Uh, the day after the inaugural. So we got our team in place. We had one setback with the attorney general who had an issue, and she could not move forward. That was a disappointment. But unlike 
the current administration, we were able to work very easily and efficiently with the deputy attorney general who had served in the George H.W. Bush administration. So we functioned, I think, quite effectively there. We moved forward, got our team in place, and you're right. That campaign had been about the economy. That was the focus of it in 1992 as President Clinton, uh, Governor Clinton at that time, ran against President Bush. And you need to remember, Rebecca, going back 25 years, there was a third candidate in that race, Ross Perot, who got 19% of the vote. So my point is, Governor Clinton only got 43% of the vote. That is not exactly a mandate. So he came to office being elected by the Electoral College, but not by an overwhelming majority. So we moved forward with our economic deficit reduction plan. We were able to first pass the Family Medical Leave Act, which really, I think, was a positive signal. He was putting people first. That had been the theme of his campaign. And then we followed that with the successful passage of the economic plan in both the House and the Senate. So the big difference between the Clinton administration and the current administration is we were able to successfully move forward with our signature initial major piece of legislation, the economic plan and the deficit reduction plan, uh, where the President Trump and, and, and the White House was not able to move forward with health care reform, and that was a real setback. The real point I wanted to make, after that first year, President Clinton's approval rating was at 58%, remembering he had come in at 43 and I think that reflected the American people's confidence, growing confidence in him and growing familiarity that the country was on the right track. That's the challenge that President Trump faces, uh, and that's what his team is working on. Uh, at this point, his, his poll numbers are not, his approval rating is not where he would like them to be. The country's divided. And that's the, the real issue before us is can we bring some measure of unity uh, to the country and move forward in in a very, very unsettled world. Do you think it was a mistake for President Trump to bring so many of the people who helped him uh, to succeed in his campaign into Washington? Because for the most part, those folks didn't really understand how Washington works. Rebecca, it's an excellent question. I think every president-elect faces a similar situation. It's the old saying, you know, uh, dance with those who brung you. And the real challenge of any new president, I think, is to, to transition, to pivot from campaigning to governing. That's the challenge in a transition. And you've, you know, worked your so heart out. So you don't out. necessarily but, want the same people that helped you, you, you campaign to Rebecca, run the government. You're exactly right. You need a mix is what you need. You certainly need to have those that did help you, that can step with you from a philosophical standpoint and so forth. But you also need experience, uh, that, uh, people that have had experience in Washington and a mix. And in, in, a, in a perfect world, I think you have some, some members of the other party, which President Clinton did as he moved forward in his administration. So I think your point is a very good one. Yeah, it, it, I, I can understand, you know, starting from scratch, as you point out, the, the time from winning in November to hitting the decks running in, in January is rather small to fill 4,000 positions. So you can hardly blame a president for uh, sticking to the people he trusts and who got him elected. But for the most part, that's bringing more Washington and Beltway outsiders into the process. And uh, it rarely works. You need a mix. You're exactly right. You've got to have some experiences like in any business. You do need some fresh thinking. There's no question about that. You need to effectively, Rebecca, use your cabinet. Richard Newstadt, the great historian, commented that he felt President Clinton's cabinet was the most loyal and effective in modern history, which we certainly took as a great compliment. Yes. The president knew his cabinet members. They were from a broad section of both elective office, the private sector, and work well with the White House. Yes. Now we have to take our first break, but stay with us. We'll be right back with more from Mac McLarty. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, Big Data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. 
It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. When I say Italy, what comes to mind? Venice. Capri. Oh my gosh, Capri was marvelous. The views, the cliffside views, or traveling to Sorrento. Pirello Tours. Oh, Pirello Tours, for sure. Pirello. Hi, I'm Steve Pirello of Pirello Tours. With over 70 years of tour experience to Italy, it's no wonder Pirello Tours is synonymous with travel to Italy. I think of the culture. And to walk up to certain areas and touch a wall and think, well, this wall's like 3,000 years old. Being on a Pirello Tour on our anniversary was better than anything I can remember ever on an anniversary. I personally approve every itinerary to ensure a stress-free, once-in-a-lifetime vacation. Salute! Call now for your free insider's guide to Perillo's Italy. Call in the next 30 minutes and qualify for a $100 gift card when you travel with us. Call 800-897-7176. 800-897-7176. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. At 7 a.m., I shower. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. At 7 a.m., I shower. I start laundry at 8. At 10, we go for a walk. Every day... I wake up at 5 a.m. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers for advice, tips, and support. Together, let's help each other better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. I am done with my mattress. That's right. I'm not spending another night on this old bag. My new mattress comes today, and this thing is out of here. Bye-bye, mattress. Yep, bye-bye, mattress. So says you and about a thousand other people every day. And that's a lot of old mattresses with no place to go. There's the landfill, of course, where they just take up space. But what a waste. Because you could send it to a mattress recycler where old mattresses get broken down into steel, foam, wood, and fiber that become new steel, carpet padding, home insulation, garden mulch, biomass fuel, locomotive oil filters, and all kinds of other great stuff. So Bye Bye Mattress is right. But don't toss it. Recycle it. It's easy. And it's free. To find a mattress recycler in your area, visit ByeByeMattress.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former White House Chief of Staff, Mr. Mac McLarty. Uh, let, let's move on to uh, the tax plan that's been proposed. Uh, there's certainly no debate between Democrats and Republicans as to whether we need a simpler and fairer tax system, but we're we're very divided as to how to go about this. And, and to this end, you've called the latest plan a deficit-financed tax reform plan. So can you explain what you mean by that in a way that we can all understand it? Rebecca, I'll do my best. I think you make the right point that we all want a, a simpler and fairer tax plan and, and a way to pay our taxes. That is much easier said than done. Our tax code is, is obviously very complicated. Uh, my I point, believe it's up to 76,000 pages right now. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with your calculation. I think <laughs> you're likely right on the mark. Uh, I, my point was that 
there should be, and I think there is, a way to certainly simplify the plan. And I, I really uh, commend President Trump and his team for coming forward with a simpler approach. I think they're in the right direction. I think most Democrats would agree with that. And by the way, I am a, by nature, a very bipartisan person. I've had the privilege to work with George, President George H.W. Bush uh, prior to working with President Clinton, not in the White House, but in many other ways during my time in the energy business. So that's that's kind of my philosophy. So I will try to acknowledge where where I think the president's team have it right and where I think they they have it wrong, at least in my view. My point was that I am very concerned about the federal deficit. You were kind enough to note that we were able to balance the budget. Uh, frankly, as a baby boomer, when we came to office, I was not sure we could a balance of budget. I thought maybe we could slow the growth of the deficit, but I wasn't sure that we could actually move toward a balanced budget. As it turned out, we got the economy going. Uh, we had good good tax revenues, and and we did cut spending. It was the smallest government since since uh, President Kennedy was in office, and that helped achieve the balanced budget. That was my concern. This tax approach uh, relies on the assumption of very dramatic growth, significant growth, and I, I question that premise, and I just don't want to mortgage future generations in terms of a overhang of a growing national deficit. I don't think that's good for our country. I don't think it makes us strong at present or for the future. That's my primary concern. I think that can be done in a balanced way while modestly reducing taxes in the right way, simplifying the code, but having offsets and cuts in spending. That's my point. Well, the thing that bothers me is, is you know, I, I've been recently looking at pension plans, mm -hmm. you know, and the fact that all these pension plans went broke. And, and there are a lot of people, as you know, a third of the country is going to retire here in ten, the next 10, 15 years. Exactly. And, and I'm looking at these pension plans and exactly the same thing happened in, in my view is that they overestimated, right, yep. what the interest rates and the returns would be on these pension plans. And, uh, and and we keep almost making the same mistake over and over again. We, we, we look at the upside, but we don't look at the downside, and which in this case, the CBO is saying we'll add $1.7 to the right. deficit. No, that you're exactly Is that right. a risk we should take? No. The answer is no, just to be blunt and, and succinct. I mean, no. here we go again. We're gambling exactly. again. Well, just exactly. And no one has a monopoly on wisdom. No one can clearly foresee the future. I think you have to make certain assumptions. But I think, Rebecca, I would respectfully suggest, and I mean this <clears throat> uh, in, in the most appropriate and respectful of manners, but President Clinton, the, what worked in the 90s to uh, approach our economy in terms of balancing the budget, having strong economic growth, uh, inclusive growth where you saw incomes rising across the board, uh, over 6 million people moved from welfare to work under welfare reform, that to me are the right sound policies to follow. And my concern is this is kind of the supply side where you cut taxes. We think that's going to create great incentives. That leads to big growth. That has just simply not been the case in past history. I'm all for simplifying taxes, appropriately reducing regulation. I think we can get the economy going. I think, Rebecca, if Washington were working together, much in keeping with your opening comments, that would go a long way toward people feeling more confident about their future, and that helps the economy too. But yes. we can't have these unrealistic assumptions. That's the point. Yes. But, but you know, in a recent article, you were approving of lowering the corporate tax rate in order to encourage more hiring. And this plan also, uh, to that point, uh, reduces the uh, top tax rate, uh, corporate tax rate from 35 to 20 percent, right. and also uh, allows uh, large investments in capital equipment um, to be deducted uh, okay. once and, again. So yeah. I, I would assume that you, you were in favor of that portion of well, it. Well, let me sharpen that a little bit, Rebecca. You, you've done your homework, as, you, as, you're, as you're known for doing, and I appreciate that and respect that. Uh, I think directionally, President Trump and his team have some things right here. Uh, I think they're wanting to simplify the code is right. Again, I think uh, uh, a different approach to regulation is, is generally right. It's, it's got to be tempered with common sense and care and me uh, in a measured way. I don't think I would lower the corporate rate, and I don't believe I've, uh, I think I was careful to, to say this, from 35 to, to, to as low as they have it. Uh, I think I would do it in a more modest way. 
Um, I do think the repatriation of funds from overseas is a big issue, and I think that's something Republicans and, and Democrats can agree on. That would give us a lot of money, yes. both from a tax standpoint at 10 percent, just pick a number if you taxed it coming back to the United States, but also an investment pool for infrastructure, which, again, I think Republicans and Democrats could agree on. So there's a lot to, to agree on, but, Rebecca, the key point, the key point, we've got to do this in a fair way. We've got income inequality, and we've got to do it in a responsible way in terms of the budget, picking up on exactly the points that you appropriately raised. See, I, I'm, I'm all for uh, incentivizing corporations yep. to invest in infrastructure uh, and that kind of thing. But what I uh, what I thought was missing here is is uh, a big incentive for research and development. That's what I was looking for. Now, I know I'm biased because, you know, I've spent most of my career in Silicon Valley and I'm a scientist by training. But I just didn't see that incentive to invest in primary research and development. And after all, that's what makes us competitive. We've got to invest for the future in in research and development, in education, in our people. You can argue whether that should be done at the national or or state level in terms of education, not research and development. But, Rebecca, if you look at some of the great breakthroughs in in technology, uh, in medicine, and so forth, they've been done at NIH and other uh, bodies at the federal government. Again, I'm not suggesting centralize everything in Washington. No, but but the Internet came out of DARPA. Exactly. You've got to basically... Uh, reform entitlements, which the Simpson-Bowles uh, Commission did on a bipartisan basis, are recommended. Unfortunately, it did not move forward, and I think that was a big setback in our country. And then make appropriate investments in the future, including research and development, exactly what you're, you're alluding to. But we've got to do that in a responsible way in the budget. And again, I, I, I think not that we did everything right. I'm not remotely trying to say that. But I think there's a pretty good template for success there. That That's really my point. Yeah, and the other thing that I was a little bit troubled by is this whole elimination of a medical deduction. Boy, um, I mean, talk about preying on people who need those breaks. You know, people that have uh, profound illnesses, that, that just really troubled you, me. You've got, I, to put, you, you've got to put people first. It's got to be an inclusive approach. Yeah, that's right. We have to take a, a, a short intermission, but stay with us. We'll be right back after these important messages from today's sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. How is Caraccioli able to grow so quickly in popularity and still maintain that special attention to detail from the field to the bottle? What's the secret? There is no secret. It's just hard work. Um, (laughs) It's something that you got to put a lot of effort in, a lot of time in. You can't cut corners. Bubbles are inherently naked, so your flaws are exposed. And when that's the case, you have to be diligent on the front end and go the extra mile to make sure that you don't cut those corners and that you do things the right way. We're in a ideal location and being able to harvest at optimal pick points, produce these grapes in the best way possible. You have great fruit and you go through these different steps and at the end you end up with a unique product that showcases the fruit in a different way. You can order any of our products directly from us by visiting our website, caracciolicellars.com, or calling the tasting room directly, 831-622-7722. I'm Paul George of the Indiana Pacers. When I was six, I had one thing on my mind. When I was six... My days were spent playing basketball every chance I could. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. So I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. I'm Paul George. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke F-A-S-T. Fast. Life is why. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. 
women now make up 37% of the workforce, changing their role forever. Harvard Medical School has now opened its doors to new female applicants. The first woman is now in space. The majority of last year's doctorate degrees were earned by women. We've come so far, but our news is changing for the worse. More women die from heart disease and stroke than men, even though it can be prevented. Make a change at GoRedForWomen.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women. Okay, what are you wearing right now? Nothing. That's right. So mommy's going to teach you how to dress yourself. Underwear always comes first, name tag at the back, then pants, then shirt. Get the first button in the right hole or you have to start all over. Socks going first, then shoes right on right, left on left. With shoelaces, just take the ends, cross them over, switch the loops, the rabbit goes down the hole, pull tight, and left with bunny ears. Got it? Why are your pants on your head? Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. Psst. Yeah, you. It's me. Your heart. Listen to me. We've got to talk. High blood pressure is serious, and yours? Whoa. What happened to us? We used to be so much more active. But lately, you've been ignoring me. I know you think I'm just going to keep ticking away forever, but you're wrong. You can do so much more to control your high blood pressure. Doing the minimum isn't doing enough. I'm under a lot of pressure and can quit whenever I want. Bet you didn't know that. But I like my job. Just treat me better. Check on me. Give me something green to nibble on every once in a while. And maybe we can do some exercise on occasion. Let's get to it. After all, we're in this together. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get your blood pressure to a healthy range before it's too late. Find out how at heart.org slash blood pressure. Check, change, control. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is former White House Chief of Staff and CEO of ARCLA, Mr. Matt McLarty. Now let's move on to health care, where our leaders are also struggling. Uh, as you know, um, many insurance companies have pulled out of state exchanges, leaving Americans with no choice in some cases, and uh, and premiums are skyrocketing in Kentucky uh, which has been sort of held up as a an example of Obamacare working, the state legislature approved a 47% increase in premiums to keep companies in their exchange. Now, you've been a proponent of the Alexander Murray bipartisan proposal, and I have found the media to be very lacking in covering this. So I'm going to ask you to speak to us about that. Rebecca, you... Uh... You bring up the the central point that governing is not easy. Uh, campaigning is is also challenging. But you can make broad statements in the campaign of either repealing Obamacare or health care for all, or you you know you'll have great health care, whatever you know whatever the campaign uh, statements are. But when you get to governing, you have to truly deliver. And there's frankly no more complicated or personal subject than health care. Uh, I think we've gotten, unfortunately, very, very uh, hung up and, and stuck on really semantics. Are we going to repeal and replace Obamacare? Or are we going to amend Obamacare and fix it and move on? How about if we just say, let's fix it? That's, <laughs> let's I think, fix let's, health care. Let, let's re- repeal. Exactly. Or that's or, it. Or, rethink yeah. it. Let's, let's, let's rethink it. it and get it right for the American people. That's exactly that's exactly the point. So my my uh, my position is that that needs to be done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I think Chairman Alexander, Senator Alexander, a Republican from Tennessee, uh, and Senator Murray, a Republican from the state of Washington, who is the ranking member of that committee, that's the right way to do it. Is for it to go through what Senator McCain calls the regular order of the House. I don't want to get uh, too much uh, inside baseball, but it's basically going through the right process to debate, discuss how to best reform our health care system. It is rethinking it. And you have Obamacare was passed. You've got certain uh, uh, elements of that in place. It is frankly popular. People have gotten accustomed to it. They don't want to give up some of those things that they now have. But the costs are too high. There are certain 
parts of it that are not working well. Even Democrats fully acknowledge that. So let's try to take a step back for the American people and get it in a better position. I do think, Rebecca, it's important for me to try to make the point that I, I don't believe we're in a position to completely overhaul and reform our entire health care system. It's just too complicated. That's too big a step right now. But I do think we can take steps to stabilize the market, going exactly to the point you make, make sure people feel much more comfortable and clearer about what they have. That's what needs to be done, and I think that's what the Alexander Murray process and compromise uh, will we'll accomplish. That's the right way to go. If we can get away just exactly what you said from this rhetoric, let's fix it. Let's get it right for the American people, and, and let's claim a bipartisan victory. I think people will, will respond to that. I think it's good policy on the most sensitive of issues, and it's good politics. Well, as you know, I'm from Silicon Valley, and there's a reason that when we introduce software, we call it 1.0. It's because when 2.0 comes out, we fixed all the things that were broken in 1.0 that we didn't release. And, and same on 3.0 and 4.0. So I'm all about incrementally fixing things. But there's also a point in time in which you look at something and all you're going to do, and we, we have an expression in software, we call it a kludge job. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't keep trying to repair software that never was designed to right. write, well, you know, to was never written well. You can't just keep patching it and patching it because you wind up with a kludge job. It's very hard to know in this particular case because this is such a complicated uh, <laughs> system. It's hard to know whether you throw it out or, or you uh, go to 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0. I hear what you're saying. You're saying uh, incremental change would be better. I really believe that's the case. I think we're where we are, and I, I, I hear your analogy, and I understand it. I, I don't think that some of the basic elements of the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, much of, much, many of which the Republicans and people that have studied health care for many years fully agree on, not, not all of it. It's, it's really a balance of, of the cost versus the benefits. And in many ways, as you well know, our health care system, our medical system, is the best in the world in terms of research and development, uh, patient care, all of that. But it's also far too expensive versus other developed countries. So I think we've got to be – we've just got to apply some common sense here, Rebecca. I think we're where we are with the Affordable Health Care Act, which was passed. It's in place. I think it clearly needs, as you say, some 2 and 3 oh, some updating and reform I, I, let's take those steps first and then move toward a more comprehensive look at it as we go forward. I, I believe that's the right that's the right pathway given where we are. I think that will support and help the American people more than more than any other approach. That's my sincere belief. Well, it is always easier to remodel a house than tear it down and start from <laughs> scratch. So so I, I hope you're right. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we've got today. But uh, before we say goodbye, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our country. I hope you'll come back and speak with us again soon. Thank you, Mr. McLarty. Thank you for your warm words. I've enjoyed our conversation. Now, today we have been talking about how difficult it is to streamline processes and get people with very different perspectives working together for the greater good. And what applies to leadership and government also applies to leadership and business. It is not easy to find the right people with the right experience and the right attitudes. But what if finding and hiring the perfect candidate could be made easier? Well, that is where one of my favorite finds of the year, ZipRecruiter, can help. With ZipRecruiter.com, you could post your job to 100-plus job sites with one click. Then powerful technology matches the right person to your job. And everyone knows if there's a way to post a job just one time and have it appear on 100 job sites, how much time that is going to save you and just how much you increase the odds of locating that perfect person for your opening. This is why ZipRecruiter is different and used by thousands of businesses, small and large. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It goes out and finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter locate a qualified candidate in just one day. Imagine that, 24 hours later, you could be speaking to somebody who is suited for your job. 
ZipRecruiter is not only thorough, it is fast. No more juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. It won't cost you anything. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Rebecca. And here's an even bigger tip. If you've got a boss that's having trouble filling a position, tell them about ZipRecruiter. Tell them that over 80% of the companies that use ZipRecruiter find a qualified candidate in just one day. So if they're kind of slow to fill that job and you feel like everybody around you is being taxed by that opening, you know, in some of these openings, I don't know, maybe the business isn't so interested in filling it so fast. <laughs> you know, I've been in places where I had to wonder, why aren't they filling that job? So, you know, if you've got a boss that, that is saying that they're having trouble filling the job, tell them to go to Zip Recruiter, Z-I-P, and then the word recruiter, R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R. And they can post the job for free, have it show up on 100 job boards. Who, who wouldn't do it? It's not going to cost you anything. No downside. Give it a try. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Rebecca. Be sure to put the slash R-E-B-E-C-C-A in there so that you won't get charged. ZipRecruiter, it's the fastest way to hire. We have to take another short intermission, but stay with us. You're listening to the Costa Report. Are you struggling with addiction or alcohol problems? If you're depressed, drinking, and using drugs, you may need help. And the Affordable Care Act guarantees coverage of substance abuse. I knew I could get myself out of this. I just needed some hope and some help. I took the first step to recovery when I made the call. Call the Addiction Hope and Helpline now for a free assessment with someone who cares. Call 800-962-6969. 800-962-6969. I feel like I'm losing control. I'm afraid I'll lose my job or even my family. Call now for hope and help with proven, gentle recovery programs. I never thought that I could be somebody who didn't drink and use drugs. I'm in recovery, getting the help I need. Call the Addiction Hope and Helpline now for a free assessment with someone who cares. Call 800-962-6969. 800-962-6969. 800-962-6969. Here's something big banks don't want you to know about, your IRA or 401k. What if you could store your IRA or 401k where you could see, touch, and hold it in person in the form of physical gold and silver coins? I know you can't do that with your stock portfolio. With Augusta Gold and Silver IRA, you can transfer retirement savings into physical coins and store them where you can actually see them, where you can get your gold faster in any disaster. Free shipping, zero management fees, and Augusta pays all upfront costs. Getting started, absolutely free. Rated A-plus with the Better Business Bureau and a 98% five-star satisfaction rating with TrustLink.org so you can trust Augusta. Call toll-free 855 777 5662 now for your free guide to Augusta Gold IRA. Call toll free 855 777 5662. That's 855 777 5662. Call Augusta today at 855 777 5662. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to mooch off your friends. You going to finish that grape? You mean the one in my mouth? You don't need to stop buying the necessities. What you're smelling is a natural musk. Ew. You don't need to be a medical test subject. How do you feel? Mostly okay. I... (laughs) Sometimes, though. (laughs) You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. You just need an internet connection. 
Don't get left behind. Start your personal savings plan with the tips and tools on feedthepig.org. That way, you don't need to sell your soul to the devil. Fifteen bucks is the best I can do. All right, deal. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Hey, America, we need to have a little talk. I don't know if you've noticed, but we got a lot of food in this country. A lot of peaches, a lot of corn, a lot of apples, a lot of everything. We've got so much food that we can't even eat it all. So if we got all this extra food, how are 17 million kids in America struggling with hunger? I just don't get it. That's why the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and gets it to the hungry kids who need it. They can get you food even if you live in Idaho or Alaska or somewhere crazy like that. This isn't complicated. We got extra food and we've got hungry kids. Feeding America's done the math. Now it's your turn. Support Feeding America in your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. I know you got internet on your phone, so what are you waiting for? We can't do it without your help. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, we've been speaking to former White House Chief of Staff for President Clinton and also the former CEO of Arkla Gas, Mac McLarty, who you'll recall passed the White House Chief of Staff job on to Leon Panetta, who we've also had the pleasure of speaking on uh, to on this program um, and uh, happened to live in my former neighborhood. <laughs> in fact, he lives on a road called Panetta Road. <laughs> So McClarty, uh, he's had a successful career both in business and also in government. And as I mentioned earlier, he was one of the youngest individuals to be elected to the Arkansas legislature. And he was also the chairman of the state's Democratic Party, in addition to advising Presidents Bush, Carter and Clinton. And according to McLarty, the first 10 months of Clinton's presidency was just as chaotic and unsettling and unproductive as Trump's first 10 months. And I happen to know, by the way, from speaking directly with Vice President Walter Mondale, that the same was true of Jimmy Carter's presidency. So these bloodthirsty pundits in the media who claim that there's chaos and infighting and disarray in the Trump administration, uh, are, who are presenting this as if it were news, they need to go back and check their facts. Because if they do, they'll quickly discover this isn't unusual at all. And one reason it isn't unusual is because most new presidents make the mistake, yes, I said mistake, of bringing those who helped them get elected to Washington, D.C. with them. They bring top campaign advisors and personnel into the West Wing and the Oval Office. Uh, This was the main issue in 1993, and the same can be said for 2017. The problem, of course, is that once the campaigning is all over, a president has to get down to business, and he only has between November and January to do it which it's not a long amount of time to hire and get on staff 4,000 members of your administration. Are you kidding me? No, I don't know anybody that could do that. Even a startup in Silicon Valley couldn't, couldn't scale up that quickly. And, and it also means working with Congress to get your agenda through. And, and, and the presidents who are successful at running, you know, at, 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 uh, at having a, um, a positive historical perspective are those that jump on this as quickly as possible. It it turns out that those people that are successful at running campaigns generally have little or no experience on how things actually work in Washington, D.C. And that's why it's normal to see a lot of turnover and consternation during the first year of any presidency, particularly when the incoming president was not a former member of the House or the Senate, which was the case for Bush Clinton, Carter, and also Trump. It takes every president a good year to figure out how to balance their administration with those who they've known for long periods of time and trust, as well as those who helped them uh, win the election and get into office, with leaders who have a track record 
of actually working in Washington. And once they get that mix right and they get their reporting structure fine-tuned and certain processes and protocols straightened out in the West Wing, well, things start moving a lot more quickly. Without going too far back in history, this pattern has been true for at least four and five administrations. And so you'll have to forgive me when I come unglued when I hear pundits on the television or on the radio go after President Trump's first 10 months with no historical perspective whatsoever. Now that said, let's talk about what these presidents were able to accomplish even after a rocky start. The relationship between the press and President Clinton was very strained when he came to office. And Clinton could not plug the leaks that were coming out of the West Wing daily. And most of his staffers were young people who didn't know the ropes in Washington. And Clinton named, by the way, a chief of staff a month later than even Trump did. But once he got the right blend of Beltway outsiders and campaign insiders and a chief of staff that brought order to the West Wing, he immediately went to work on building bipartisan support for his programs in Congress. There wasn't going to be any such thing as getting his initiatives through Congress without wooing Republicans. And so that became the order of the day. And similarly, we now see the Trump administration following this same course, which, by the way, paved the way for Clinton's reelection in 1996. So before pundits get too far out ahead of themselves, claiming that the current administration is failing and pointing to the recent congressional elections as more indication, more proof that Trump is failing, I say let's take a good look at the first year of other presidencies and get a grip. They all started out rocky. But that doesn't mean that once they hit their stride, these presidents did not find a way to broker bipartisan support through compromise make peace with the media, and go on to be reelected. I realize we live in a time when the country and the media is divided, and I understand that the election of Donald Trump has elevated our emotions, and I can even go as far as saying that some of the negative publicity has been self-inflicted by Trump himself. But what I do not understand is portraying the current president as a failure in any way, especially given the first year history of both Republican and Democratic presidents who were Washington outsiders. In this respect, Trump is accurate when he calls the media out by referring to fake news. If the president's rocky start isn't particularly unusual, then it isn't news. And when you report on something that isn't news, well, then I think it's fair to call it fake news. News that isn't really new is fake. And that's how I see it. Now, we've been talking about a number of complex issues today, issues which first have to be streamlined and boiled down to their essential parts before we can even begin to make them better. And speaking of streamlining and making things better, Harry's Razors had this idea long before anyone else did. The founders of Harry's knew there had to be a less expensive way to get a premium razor and a premium shave. So they, this is what they did. I'm going to tell you. They scoured the earth to find and then they bought a German factory with 100 years of blade making experience. And then they cut out the middleman. They made the decision to go direct to you. And that decision has led to the finest razor in the industry at the lowest possible price. And if you don't think that makes a difference, if you don't think it makes a difference when you shave with a Harry's razor, then you ask any one of the 3 million men who have switched to Harry's. And, and the, I got to tell you, more are switching every day because they email me and say, I just thought you were just you know, talking off the top of your head. But I got to tell you, I got a great shave at a fair price. And I, which brings me to my point, there are some things I can't tell you about, some things you have to experience for yourself. So Harry's has removed all the stops and they're offering listeners of the Costa Report a free trial 
All you do is go to harrys.com slash Costa, C-O-S-T-A, to get your free Harry's Razor Kit, which includes an ergonomically designed razor handle, five precision blades, shaving gel, and travel blade cover. And all you pay for is shipping. I give you my word that once you try a Harry's Razor, you're not going to use anything else. So jump on your mobile phone or your tablet or whatever device you have. Go to harrys.com slash Costa to get your free trial razor, blades, gel. I have to tell you, I'm in love with their gel. You're going to be in love with their gel too. And a travel blade cover. Remember, put in the slash Costa, C-O-S-T-A, to get the complete kit at no cost. This offer is not going to last. That's harrys.com slash Costa for your free trial razor kit. And if you have a son or a husband or a brother or a friend who shaves every single day, well, order the free trial kit for them. I got one for my son, Matthew, who you've heard me talk about many, many times, and he has been hooked on it ever since. He is an avid Harry's Razor fan. And that's all the time we've got this hour. My guest next week was anchor for the early show as well as co-host on Fox and Friends, Gretchen Carlson. And she's going to be here to weigh in on how the Roger Ailes case paved the way for women to break their silence on Weinstein and others. Don't miss Gretchen Carlson next week right here on the only program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of the Costa Report. Listen up, because I want to let you in on a little secret. You don't have to be a psychic to know which business and political experts are going to be on the Costa Report next month. All you have to do is sign up for our free monthly newsletter at RebeccaCosta.com. It takes less than a minute, and when you do, you'll receive our guest schedule along with special announcements and free offers the first of every month. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and sign up today. Hi, I'm Joan London with A Place for Mom. Over the years, we've helped thousands of families find senior care, and today's senior living communities have never been better. With amazing amenities like movie theaters, exercise rooms and swimming pools, even pet care services. And nobody understands your options like the advisors at A Place for Mom. Best of all, it's a free service. To get our free ebook on financing senior care, as well as a free referral for senior living communities in your area, call 1-800-806-8572. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. I improved my credit score. You're kidding, right? Uh, no. How are we supposed to be the bad boys of electrosynth pop if you're out there being responsible? The band is about to be discovered. This is our year. Uh, yeah, you've been saying that for a while now. You think anyone in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was worried about their credit score? I never really thought that. Of you're... course they weren't. Rock stars aren't supposed to think about that kind of stuff. We're supposed to think about how many guitars we've smashed, write aggressively sensitive power ballads, start questionable fashion trends, tragically break up and blame creative differences. All right, all right, just... I thought maybe it was time to take control of my finances, you know? Start using a budget. Get out of debt. Set some goals. A budget? Debt? Set some goals? Listen, I knew that we'd have our creative differences, but I was hoping they'd involve a little more scandal. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. The Costa Report is now heard in all 50 states on fine radio stations, including this one.